I was actually pretty excited excited to uh to put this presentation together because it it's not directly related to uh, the overall pine map project, but I think the more I, I put the slides together, the more I realize it is. So what we did here is maybe uh, the the scale is maybe too fine to uh, to do the same type of measurements or modeling through throughout the pine map project, but I'm hoping maybe in year two and three, it's in some of the tier three sites, we actually might be able to do the same. So what I'm going to talk about right now is uh, actually how night transpiration, but also deep water uptake, so water uptake by deep roots, can actually affect carbon water budgets in three lovely pine plantations. So, and before I start, I also would like to thank everybody involved in this project. So, and you can see them on the on the slide. And this has actually been a collaboration between people from the Forest Service or with the FATAC, involving Steve and Guy and Michael, but also people in France with the INOA, who uh, people who are located in the, here in Bordeaux. And after Asko, John, and myself uh, with um, NC State. So, we we all know this slide, at least we actually know we have a better one than this one. We have the one that spanned over the, the entire southeast. But I like this one because if you, you could look at all the the small red dots here, they actually represent, I think it's a five by five mile stand, pure lovely pine stand. And so if you can see through how throughout, sorry, the, the whole state, there are like thousands of those sites. Also, I like this map because we can actually see three different regions. So what we call the coastal plain here of Carolina with very rich organic deep soil. And we have a stripe here of what we call the sand hills, which is pretty much pure, pure sand just maybe over 1% clay and with no nitrogen and very low organic matter in the soil, so very poor uh, soil. And those, this band of, of land actually spans from mid North Carolina to, to uh, a few hundred miles in the, into South Carolina. And finally, we have what we call the Piedmont. So it's it's in between, meaning there is more clay, and usually roots cannot go very deep, up to one meter maximum, because there is a clay pan, and it's very difficult for the the roots to penetrate that. So we're going to focus today on these three different sites, very contrasting contrasting sites, meaning that we can actually see if everything we we find or the relationships we have can be applied to different types of soil. So, lovely pine, as you all know, at least in, the, in North Carolina and throughout the southeast, is a very productive species. So, this graph, who uh, was put together by ASCO, show different plantations from, so here we have sites in Canada, in red, in blue in Wisconsin, and after we have those sides here, which are plantations from here, from North Carolina, that's the Duke site, the black ones are from the site on the coast of North Carolina, and the square are from Florida. You can see how productive, not productive, how those sites represent actually strong sink of carbon. And what is interesting in this map is that you can see the sensitivity. So in those sites, as soon as the, the, the sites are maybe five to, to ten year old, they start switching from being a strong 
sink, a sewer, sorry, to a sink of carbon. So once we had those data, we tried to understand why why is that, at least for our sites in North Carolina. So what we realized in the last two, three years is that in these sites with deep roots, every time there was drought or every time there was a difference in, in water potential or water moisture, soil moisture between the deep and the shallow soil layers, there was what we called hydraulic lift, meaning some water was taken by the roots, deep roots, moved up to the upper soil and this water, which was moved at night, could, was used in the next morning by the trees. And so we tried to model that. So here you can see in red, in red here, that's what we measured with the Ediflux tower. And in black here, that's our modeling. So two years ago, we used a very simplistic model. And today, I'm going to show you like a more advanced one. So with this simplistic model, you can see that for GPP and here for NEE, we're able to pretty much predict NEE and GPP. So what we did after that, once the model was uh, parameterized and gave some good estimates, we rerun the model by switching off the hydraulic redistribution, meaning we say, okay, what happens if this lift by the deep roots didn't occur? And that's what we have in white. So what's, what happens that for GEP, we actually had over two years from 7 to 8, 08, which were very two very dry years, we had a, a, a decrease by almost 1,500 or 1,000 to 1,500 uh, gram of carbon per square meter over two years. And as a consequence, since respiration didn't decrease that much, it actually sometimes because soil was drier, even actually, yeah, respiration didn't increase that much, actually even decreased, we ended up by predicting that the sites would be, would go from like a very strong sink, like almost 800 over two years, to almost being neutral. Meaning that if we switch off this lift by the deep fruits, we pretty much predict after one year that there won't be any any carbon sequestrated in this site. So now two slides. Now that we sh I, I show you first the results and over the last two years and why we we decided to keep working on that. Now I'm just briefly for those who are, don't really know what we mean by hydraulic redistribution, or sometimes it's called the lift, but Redistribution is a, is a better word because it implies that water can be moved up, but also after distributed in every direction, not only up and down, but laterally. So during the day, you can see water is taken by the roots, deep, shallow roots, and transpiration occurs, so there is water loss. So here we are showing that a tree is like a shrub because this, this phenomena was first discovered on actually very dry dry systems with shrubby systems. At night, when we have the right conditions for the lifting to, uh, to occur, what happens is that water is taken by the deep roots, moves into the shallow roots, goes back into the soil. The same water goes up at night, I mean, and goes back into the soil. This is possible because there is a gradient of water potential that is stronger inside the root system than within the soil. Because when the soil gets very dry, the conductivity of the soil declines so fast that there's pretty much too much resistance for water to move up into the soil. So the path of least resistance goes pretty much from the roots the soil to the roots to the soil. And the next morning, what happens again is that this water that has been brought here in the shallow roots is transpired. So you can see from that that this can work if there is no transpiration night, or at least not too much. Because if the, the tree acts as a sink for water, 
is actually a competition for water, and water goes just up and is lost a night without actually doing bringing any extra carbon. So how what does what we call HR hydraulic redistribution look like? So here we have two contrasting systems, one in, in Brazil and one on the on the west coast in Oregon. So on the deep layer you can see here from six centimeters to almost two meters, if you measure soil moisture, that's what we you get. You get a decline during the day, trees are losing water, pretty much flat at night, again, again and again. If you look in uh, Ponderosa Pines, pretty much the same. Now, on the same site and the same day, if you look at the upper soil layer, we can see that during the day there is a decline in soil water storage, meaning trees are pumping water, but at night soil moisture goes up and again and again. You can see the same pattern in the pine system. Although everything is still going down, you can see there is a recharge at night here. That's measured with soil moisture probes. If you look at the soil water potentials, it's pretty much the same. Here you can see that in the in Brazil where the, the lift was almost like 0.2 millimeters a day, you can see that there is a decline from 1.35 to 1.45 megapascal during the day, but at night there is a recharge, meaning some, some water has been brought back into the soil. So what we can do now, we can actually measure the decline and the recharge, and we can get an idea about how much lift we have compared to how much transpiration we have. Hi, JC, let That's me interrupt you just, just real quick. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind maybe using the pointer to point out some of the areas you're talking about when there's multiple graphs, it might make it a little easier. Oh, it doesn't work. Uh, I thought I had one. It's the firecracker icon. Yeah. Does there it work go. here? Now it's working. Oh, yes, I, ha now it works. I, I, had the, I had the firecracker, but I thought everybody was seeing it. I can see it now. Can everyone else see it? If you'll give us a check mark, if you can see that pointer. Okay. okay. Looks like it's working now. Thank you. So, how does it work? So here we measure in a young site, and here uh, what we call the meat rotation site, uh, lovely pine. So now we go back to the the pine map project. That's those trees are pretty much four year old, seventeen, I guess, in between the the age you have been studied, but what we can see is that we have just transpiration rates, water used by the tree here, that's estimated with um, using soil moisture probes, the same here for the 17-year-old trees, and here you can see the green points are what we call daily hydraulic distribution. So it doesn't seem that much, but you can see one here and one here and here one here, you can see some time of the year where if you compare if you compare those points to those points and you, we have the results here at the bottom, it looks like we almost have 20 to 30 percent of the water used by the trees during a day comes from water lifted at night, okay? And here, early in the season, it's pretty much 20%, and after the average for the mid-rotation site goes up to almost 50%. So in here, in this case, we actually predicted that up to almost one millimeter a day, which is highly significant, and the mean was like half a millimeter a day. The direct consequence of this lift is that it's going to increase soil moisture. So here in black we have what we measured. So that soil moisture, assuming that there is hydraulic distribution because it's part of the equation, and we rerun the model and that's in white, and this is showing what will have been the soil moisture dynamic without the lift. And you see that late September, October on 07 where there was a severe drought, 
you could actually decrease by almost 10% from moisture. And here you can see in triangle that's pre dawn water potential. And they show you that when pre dawn are pretty high or less negative, there's pretty much no differences, meaning there is no lift. So, suggesting that there is also a relationship between the transpiration rate, the physiology of the tree, and the lifting, the water lifted. So, next, can we? predict root functioning under future climate, meaning if we can actually make the hypothesis that the lift is important, is it going to be changed under future climate? And if yes, what what is going to happen to water fluxes and carbon exchange? So to do that, we just used models. So for precipitation, in North Carolina, you know, right now we that's one of the scenarios, one of the 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 A one B doesn't predict that much changes. But and I'm sure you all know this map, you can see that if we go ac actually more inland, especially in Texas, we may have like twenty four, twenty five percent re reduction of precipitation. But for today, what I'm gonna show for the current conditions or the future conditions, some of the data are just assuming there's no change in precipitation. And after that, I'm going to show some model outputs where we are going to reduce precipitation by by 50 millimeters uh, at each, each step. So <laughs> precipitation, you know, as I said, it's it's pretty it's highly viable and but when, when there is a water shortage and that's that's the case, that was the case in seven oh eight, and that's where we're we're going to Compare our modeling outputs to model to measure data we that that was collected in 07 and 08, and as you can see in Raleigh, that's actually pretty uh, impressive. And so the the last parameter we use in the model for the future conditions is an increase in temperature. And so we just we were pretty safe. We just assumed that what we are going to call future conditions will be just with uh, an increase in temperature by three, 3 degrees Celsius. OK, so if I go back, that's what I presented to you, these two figures here. During the day, water is lost in red. At night, water is moved up from the, the steep to the shallow root layers and after used again. And you could have two different scenarios depending on, on, the, on the season. Here, what we have is that, okay, if night transpiration, if the air is getting drier and drier, if there's an increase in temperature, with assuming the same humidity, VPD is going to go up. If VPD goes up, especially at night, we can actually predict and calculate that night transpiration would increase as well. If night transpiration increases, the water lifted by the deep roots will actually not be stored in the shallow roots for too long, meaning right away, as soon as it's moved up, water will be lost at night, which means that hydraulic redistribution might still be present under official conditions, but the water will be lost and used right away. So to model that, to model change in temperature, but also later on precipitation. Also, in the model, what we call future conditions, we added a CO2 increase going from 380 ppm right now to to, to 580 ppm in our, in our simulation. So we use what we call the Musica model. So Musica is as described here. It's a multi-layer simulator simulating the interaction between the canopy and atmosphere. So this model was developed in 2003 by Auger, who worked here at uh, INA in France. So this model, the advantage of this model is that you can actually have several root profile, also several species. So right now, we are only modeling lovely pine, but it means you can actually have lovely pine plus the grass, or plus, for example, understory. And you could have up to three, four different species together. 
and also you can model leaf area. You can have up to 12 layers of, of foliage. Now, if we look at what the model does, so there is pretty much three different modules. Heat, soil water storage, photosynthesis, respiration, and after there is evaporation transpiration. And so that was in 1993 and last year. So we, we worked with uh, Jérôme who wrote the codes and we were able to add a few, a few new parameters. So here what we added was that we, we tried to partition the soil layers into different resistances, meaning if we know the resistance or connectivity in deep roots and shallow roots, we we can actually apply those different differences, these different resistances to our model. We also added a hydraulic redistribution function, meaning if the water potentials between the soil and the plants are such as that water can actually leak from the roots back to the soil, we we can have a flag and predict that. After, so temperature effect was already embedded in the model just to, to predict what would be the, the effect of temperature on photosynthetic parameters and the same for CO2 and fertilization. And the last parameter we used, we actually added in the model was we added a root and stem cavitation function, meaning that when the soil is getting drier, when the water potential in the plant is getting more negative, this is going to induce some loss of conductivity due to cavitation, and so conductance is going to go down again, and so feedback onto the model. We use three different, as I said at the beginning, three very different sites. The first one, sand hills, so you can see the roots here goes up to two meters and way deeper, but that's pretty much where we are at that time. That's a picture given by uh, Chris Meyer. That's where they stopped digging. And so here you have the root profile, and you can see that although 50% of the roots are within the first 50 centimeters, there are still a lot of roots below that. And so you can see here someone in the pit. That's actually part of the root system of the one of the tap roots. In this site, leaf area is very low, 1.6 to 3.5, depending if we model the, the control conditions or the fertilized plot, because here are seed trees, they actually had, as you may know, they had two or three different treatments. They had just control, irrigation, irrigation, fertilization, fertilization. <clears throat> so we use data from the literature, we use data from people cited here to parameterize the model. And no hydraulic redistribution, that's what we we thought at the beginning. It's part of the hypothesis. The second side is the one we have on the coast, coastal forest. So it's part of the Ameriflex data set. It's the US NC2. It's very deep organic soil, as you can see here, up to almost 40 centimeters. And here, the same roots are mostly in the upper layers, but we, up to one and a half meters, 1.2, where we stop digging, we, we actually can find almost up to 20% roots. So there is kind of a lot of root system below ground. Once again, we use data from, from a group to parameterize the site. Here we predict high lift because we also measure that. And this site is characterized by a high LEI from 3.5 to 4.8. The last site we used is the Pinman, is the Duke Forest. The US Duke one for the and Ameriflux uh, data set. This site is characterized by shallow roots and poor clay soil. And so you can see here pretty much 30 centimeters of with some organic matter, clay and sand, after it's pure clay. And pretty much 90% of the roots are in the first 30 centimeters. From this site, we also used um, the response of trees, water transport parameters, but also so the synthetic parameters to elevated CO2, which we actually applied to the other sides. Model outputs. So first, briefly here, 
that's for the, the Parker site where we had measured transpiration with subflux, GPP and any those were derived from Ediflux. So you can see the good agreement. It's also because we pretty much we were able to measure all the needed parameters for the modeling. So the the line here represents the switch from four or five days with a lot of sunlight to pretty much overcast day. Here we are able to compare what we call the measured lift hydraulic redistribution. So it's in black over two years. We measure with some moisture probes. And in red, that's what the model predicts. And the model right now under predict the lift. I call it leakage because it's the amount of water that is going back into the soil from the roots. The green one, what I call recharge, is the lift calculated by soil moisture differences predicted by the model. And the same, it's actually it's more noisy and also under predict what we measure. Now here we can see every three hours that simulation of root uptake under future conditions, meaning with plus three degrees C and high CO2. I'm showing that because what we can see is that here you can see in in, in uh, yellow that what happens when temperature goes up and the air is getting drier, there is actually increase in night transpiration. You can see that midnight, 3 a.m., and after 6 a.m., when it's getting maybe less dry, there is less night transpiration. The problem with this night transpiration is that this night transpiration reduced the hydraulic redistribution. And you, you can see the lift here is just the dark. It's actually not that much because of the competition between the trees losing water at night and the roots and the soil getting water at night. So you can see the dark spots here. What's interesting also in here is that you can see the, the dynamic of soil moisture when actually there's a switch between the shallow layers to deep layers as soon as you actually hit a drought here and also after you know, 3, 3 p.m. the same. We also, to be sure the model was pretty much working on other sites, we just recently tried to use another system, and that's one in New Mexico. We have Pinion and Juniper, and you can see the model measured. So, because, you know, we are, people always criticize, and I think they're right, when we actually parameterize a model using our site, and after we run the model on our site, which means it's, it's, it's a nice tool, but if we can apply the, this tool to other systems, it's pretty limited. So at least now we are confident that we can actually use this model to predict and work with other systems. So that's one of the, the main figures showing here we have the root uptake, so that's water use. It could be equal to transpiration. If you sum up all the colors, you know, every day, you should actually be pretty close to subflux measurement or tree transpiration. Here we have root leakage, or if you wish, lift, water lifted by the trees. And here, which won't spend too much time today, is the predicted soil water potential by the model. So if we go back to here, so we have the coastal plain, deep organic soil, sandy soil, and the clay, the duke side. So what we can see is that there is actually differences in where water is taken that's pretty much driven by root profile. So you can see here in the, in the in switch from shallow roots, although pretty much all year long, water is taken by the sh from the shallow layers. But there is actually, when there's an increase in water demand, and when there is no, there is less precipitation, there is a switch to deep layers. If we go here to the sandy side, pretty much 80% of the water is taken by the by the shallow roots and a little bit pretty uniformly from deep layers. At the deep side, everything is pretty much located within the first 60 centimeters. With once again, once there is a 
less precipitation, a drought occurring. Like that, that, that was I think early, uh, early, early July or uh, uh, mid June. You can see some switch to deeper layers. Now, if we look here at the root leakage, so or the lift, the redistribution, you can see at this side there is actually quite a lot, and pretty much everything is located here. So this water here, which goes from zero to almost 0.3 millimeters a day, is the amount of water leaking from the trees back into the soil at night. This side, pretty much nothing. At this side, we predict quite a little bit, we can see the numbers later, but less than 10%. And as I said, I'm not going to spend time on soil water potential, just to say that they're actually, they, they compare pretty well to what we measured with a pressure chamber. Now, so over the, the whole year, so how, how well does the model predict three water use? And after GPP and NEE. So here on those three figures, so everything white is just control. When we have white and a dot here, it's um, control and it's fertilized. The dark ones here are elevated CO2 only. So we go from a control to elevated CO2. And the pink ones are fertilized and elevated CO2. Okay, so to be clear, white ones are current conditions, the black ones are elevated CO2 conditions, meaning and high temperature, so it's future conditions, and the peak ones are the same as the black ones, except that we added nitrogen fertilization. So what's happening? You can see that the predicted versus model is actually not too bad, so we that's the full lines here. The dashed lines represent what the model will have predicted without the lift, and you can see that for T, without the lift, there will be like a reduce in precipit in, uh, in T, meaning in transpiration, by by 10 to 25 percent. The same for GPP, less of an effect, but still between 10 and 15 percent. And for NEE, you can see that without the lift, NEE will be reduced by two to 300 uh, gram of carbon per square meter per year. So once again, that's just to show that the model fit it pretty well, and also show the effect of redistribution on transpiration, GPP, and NEE. Let's put some numbers behind everything. So here we have the three sites, coastal, sand hills, and uh, the Duke phase site. So root leakage, or uh, in parentheses, lift, hydraulic lift. So the annual it's so what we show in one of the figures. It's pretty much 14% at the coastal. However, under fitted conditions, we only predict 4% of lift. The same for the other sites. We have very low lift over the, the entire season, and this will decrease with future conditions. Future conditions here meaning, again, I repeat, higher temperature, higher CO2 level. If we only look at the growing season, at this site, we almost have 20 to 45% of root leakage, meaning that 20% of the water used by the trees comes from redistribution at night. And this goes down in sand hills, and at Duke Face site, it's somehow lower, but we think still significant, 7 to 11%. And once again, future conditions will reduce this amount of water, because under future conditions, that's what we see in this line, the effect of night transpiration, T night on root leakage, there is a sharp increase. Because future conditions will increase night transpiration, this will actually reduce hydraulic redistribution. So here, right now, we have 25% of the water cannot be lifted because there is some night transpiration. In 2050, with future conditions, this will go to 41%, meaning that 41% of the lift in 2050 is predicted to be lost 
at night. So water will be lifted, but this water will go out through transpiration and not used through photosynthesis. It's also very highly significant for the other side, but because of these two sides, because the lift is so small, we think that will actually affect water used by, by that much. Now the last one is the effect of root cavitation on hydraulic fluid distribution. So 17% here means that when the soil gets too dry, cavitation occurs in the roots, and so the roots are not moving water the same way, or at least they are less efficient. Connectivity goes down. And so cavitation actually has an effect on, on redistribution. So if you have a system that cavitates very fast, first of all, you reduce respiration, but you also reduce the lift. So that's pretty much what this is showing here. And that's very strong at the Duke site because most of the roots are in the upper shallow layers, which means that they cavitate faster. Whereas at the other sites, where it's, the roots are more uniformly uh, spread throughout the, the soil horizons, there is less of an effect of cavitation on lift. So now the final results showing that the effect or the, the change, sorry, the change in transpiration for the three sites here in GPP as a function of transpiration. So once again, the white are current conditions. The black ones are future conditions, meaning only high temperature and high CO2. And the red ones are future conditions plus nitrogen fertilization. So what we can see is that if precipitation goes down, and here we only show a decline over a year, meaning, for example, this year we have 900 millimeters of precipitation. What happens if next year we we go back to 600? So here 600 is the a fresh hold because that's the minimum precipitation uh, regime ever measured, at least in North Carolina. And so we can see the sharp decline. That's what pretty much the model predicts, at least for the Pinman and for the coastal. What is interesting is that for the coastal site, and the future conditions, you can see it here, here, the system will become more sensitive. So as precipitation will go down from one year, one year to the other, transpiration, but also GPP here, will decline faster. We decline faster because under future conditions, hydraulic distribution will be less will be inhibited by night transpiration, which means that when this extra amount of water, which under very dry years can represent almost 40% of transpiration, won't be able to be used by the trees. Also, what this is showing is that overall, so there will be a decline in, in precipitation in the future conditions. But on the other hand, there will be an increase in, in GPP increase that, as you can predict, will be lower when precipitation goes down. And the difference is we're actually pretty strong at the sand hill side, where it's very poor no nutrients, where there was almost an increase by, by like 40 to 60 percent in GPP. The same as the Duke site, where there was an increase and there are good water conditions, an increase in GPP by, by almost 25 percent. Now, if we put together everything, so the, we can actually calculate the water use efficiency. And what it's just showing is that future conditions in black or future conditions and fertilization will actually almost, at least in some cases, double water use. Those values are, may seem pretty high to you, but that's the water use using the tree transpiration. So well, here we do not divide uh, the carbon uptake by the all water used by the site, but only by the water transpired by the trees. And so, sand hills pretty much no response precipitation because the roots are really deep. For the Piedmont and the coastal site, again, there will be a, an increase in water use efficiency when precipitation goes down, but you can see that under future conditions here, 
they will be more sensitive because there is no lift occurring, meaning the trees will be still be able to uptake carbon with actually proportionally less water. Now, the sorry, the last oop, the last figure for the results. What happens to the NEE? And so the arrows here again represents 600 millimeters, which is the minimum the precipitation level of precipitation that ever measured here in North Carolina. So what we have here is that for the three sites, so the, the Piedmont, the Duke, the Sand Hills, the coastal one, so NEE is going to is predicted to first be less more negative, so the sites will become a higher sink of carbon under future conditions. Okay? With here fertilization does not actually affect that much. Everything because in the model there was also a fertilization actually also increased somehow respiration. But what you can see is that under normal conditions, let's say eight hundred one thousand millimeters, the Piedmont site would be we see like sorry, uh, a reduce in any so sorry. What I said before was wrong. The 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 site will become a stronger uh, source of carbon. So meaning less carbon will be taken by the site. And so you can see that right now all the sites are at least the Piedmont sites and the coastal ones, especially coastal ones, are very strong sink of carbon. But we predict that if precipitation goes down, those sites will actually become less of a sink, and for the coastal one, the, the Piedmont one, Duke, will almost become neutral if precipitation reaches almost five to six hundred millimeters a year. <coughs> also, what we can see again, at least for the coastal one here, that city condition will be more sensitive to the decline in precipitation, and we related that to, again, the inhibition of hydraulic lift under fitted conditions, meaning that the decline in TNGPP will be faster. As a consequence, any will actually go down faster under fitted conditions. Just to remind you, the white current conditions the black is only increase in temperature and CO2, temperature by 3 degrees Celsius and CO2 by 200 ppm. And the pink ones, the same conditions as the black ones, high CO2, high temperature, but we added fertilization, natural fertilization. So to conclude, first, we had actually three, let's say, keep in mind, three main results. The first one, through the conditions will reduce three water use by 20% and increase GPP and water use efficiency. Fertilization will reduce water use even more because of, and here I'm trying to explain why we had such results, because of wood biomass and also fertilization tend to decrease plant hydraulic capacity, meaning what we call K plant, whole plant hydraulic conductance. Phytoclimatic conditions will increase nighttime transpiration. We show that there was almost 10 to 15 percent higher night transpiration, and this is going to limit the effect of hydraulic lift. It doesn't mean we there won't be any lift, but the lift, the water lifted, would just be lost through transpiration at night, and this water loss won't buy us any carbon, meaning water is going to be lost, and that's it. And we can see that at the coastal site where the lift represents sometimes up to 25% of the water transpired over the entire day, the reduction in this lift will actually increase the sensitivity to drought, and will reduce overall water efficiency and carbon gain. So the next step, at least the first one I, I included here, would be that if now we can model 
and predict pretty well the change in water fluxes and carbon fluxes because of increase in CO2 and temperature and reduced deep water lifted by the trees. What is the link now between this change in, in, in carbon and water fluxes? The link with future climate. Meaning, if we reduce transpiration, or if we increase transpiration at night, if we reduce transpiration during the day, there's going to be some feedback with the atmosphere. And maybe there will be fewer, for example, rainfall triggers, clouds formation, and so on. So the idea is, can we just create or establish a link between the, the, the root functioning and climate.